the future of RTS gaming on the PC is actually looking quite promising. Some famous franchises are set to make a welcome return. We've also seen several studios pop up who are dedicated to creating RTS titles. Join me as we take a look through some of the most promising upcoming releases. Now before we begin, there's just one thing I need to clarify. When I mention beloved franchises, you may be thinking of Command & Conquer. Now while there was a CNC trailer at Gamescom, I'm sorry to tell you but it's actually a mobile game. It's not even an RTS. It's been outsourced and is full of microtransaction, cash grab, predatory BS. So nah, that's not really a new CNC game. Now as far as real games are concerned, let's start with a sequel which we've had to wait almost 20 years for and has a massive cult following. I'm talking about the Homeworld series. Homeworld 3 is scheduled for release in early 2024, and we've seen plenty of footage up to this point. So it's basically a sci-fi space combat RTS, and it takes place in a 3D environment in the sense that you can move your, your ships around in any direction, any dimension, as opposed to other RTS games which might typically be a top-down or three-quarter view looking at a flat map. This is fully moving through space. Now while the first two installments in the series were definitely highly regarded by fans and critics alike, one criticism tended to be that because the battles were taking place in three dimensions in open space, there tended to be a lack of sort of items of interest, artifacts, objectives, cover in the maps. Sometimes you were just battling in just blank spaces it would feel like. And the developer, Blackbird Interactive, have come out really strongly for Homeworld 3 with a whole new kind of cover system and some really, really neat sequences of play where units are hiding behind objects which are blocking projectiles or hiding within tunnels which are disrupting scanners and things like that. And it really looks quite dynamic. So the core gameplay is basically a single player RTS campaign with a sense of progression because from mission to mission, you retain what remains of your fleet of ships. And the difficulty of the next mission is tailored based on how well you survived the previous one. Now what I think is a really interesting addition to the core gameplay is the new three-player cooperative wargame mode. It's session-based with roguelike elements, so essentially you're facing randomized fleets of enemy ships and they become impressively more powerful. You just have to survive basically and complete objectives. The developers say they were heavily inspired by the co-op mode from Risk of Rain 2. Another thing that we know is that Homeworld 3 will be shipping with official mod support, which is powered by mod.io. Now what this will allow players to do is they'll be able to create their own custom levels, custom campaigns, and also augment their ship designs. But this may mean that Homeworld 3 becomes a new destination for these kind of fantasy space battles where people recreate famous ships from Star Trek and pit them against famous ships from Star Wars and so on. Although I do hope there'll be lots of actual Homeworld 3 content created. So personally, this might be the one that I'm the most excited about. I think um, it looks fantastic, it sounds fantastic, and it seems like the developers are doing things the right way. And by that I mean, this game has been delayed, it should have come out in 2023, but they wanted, and I quote, to deliver the quality experience that fans deserve. So they pushed it back to make sure the quality is there. Remember doing that, Blizzard? So here we have Tempest Rising, which has been developed by quite a big studio in THQ Nordic and is actually available in a playable demo right now. I can see why this game might be described as the spiritual successor to Command & Conquer, because in playing it, it feels just like CNC. It really does. I don't think they made any real effort to try and hide that fact either. So the game is planning to have three asymmetrical factions, and in the demo we see two of them, which I would basically say are the equivalent of the GDI and the Nod from Command & Conquer. And then I suspect the third one, which has not been revealed yet, will probably be to do with this sort of alien artifact kind of influence that we see in the trailer. In terms of gameplay mechanics and everything else, they're not really taking any big risks here. They're sticking to the tried and true formula. You collect resources, you build buildings, buildings produce units, you go and have a battle, basically. But then obviously it's about things being fun and looking good and sounding good, which they do. In addition to very familiar gameplay, I think two things that really reminded me of Command & Conquer were kind of cutscenes in the main campaign. So the very sort of colourful characters and 
epic moments and also the music the music really slaps it's kind of heavy metal you know the kind of stuff you remember from command and conquer and the full soundtrack is actually available on youtube if you want to go and check it out on the official thq nordic channel but yeah i think um it all feels very familiar so they're not really taking any great chances but i mean it could just be a good fun rts and that's what a lot of us have been craving for a while this next game is a sort of open source fan produced title and it's currently in an open alpha so you can go and experience it today if you want to and i'm very excited about this because you could argue this is the spiritual successor to total annihilation and i'm going to die on this hill that is the greatest rts of all time total annihilation was released in the late 90s and it was very successful certainly had a large cult following and as the years went by, the, the limitations of the, the engine became more evident in terms of it wasn't fully 3D and there was a hard cap on the number of units that could be involved in any given map, basically. So sort of third-party developers, the community, created the Spring Engine, which is basically a way to make the game fully 3D, have mods, extra modded units, take away any kind of hard caps on things like that, and just make it a more full experience. So basically, as the years and, and the decades have gone by, Spring has really sort of gone from strength to strength and people have created their own various projects within this. And perhaps the most prominent one of these is Beyond All Reason, which is this new open source RTS, which is, it's not trying to be a clone of Total Annihilation, but it certainly seems to share a lot of the, the sort of uh, philosophies and the, the interesting qualities of the original. Now, what you can expect from a game like BAR is huge armies, massive unit counts, huge variety in the potential units you can create. We're expecting hundreds and hundreds of different types and large scale multiplayer battles, just epic in scale. We're talking eight versus eight with thousands of units, explosions, laser beams, projectiles. It's just absolute carnage, but it's, it's just fun. It's, it's never overwhelming. It's never confusing. It's just it's just really good. You can get into it very easily, but there's also a high skill cap, which is the perfect balance. The developers are currently working towards an official Steam release, and I've been following the progress of this title for a couple of years now, and it really is quite remarkable to see the profound improvements that have been made. Every couple of months, they're making a fundamental change to the graphics or the engine or the gameplay, and it's really reached a point now where I think it's quite fully featured and polished and there's real potential for this title i believe and i think it'd be fantastic if we could have a modern rts which delivers that ta style gameplay which i i do think is unmatched in the genre now obviously the starcraft franchise had a huge influence on the rts scene and we still speak of other games in terms of how they compare to starcraft and the next two games that i'm going to feature they're both developed by people that have connections to Blizzard, either they worked with Blizzard or were involved in the professional StarCraft II scene. So, very interesting. In terms of the two titles, the first one is Zero Space. And I think this one is a lot closer to being in a condition where you could release the final game. It's very much uh, fully featured and well polished already. The game is being developed by a fairly small studio featuring several industry veterans. But the more unusual part of this is the fact that a number of StarCraft II pro gamers and community personalities are involved in the game design as well. For example, we have Katz, who is a lead versus designer, and legendary Zerg player Scarlet, she is lead balance designer. You also have Pig, who is a design consultant and game tester, and then Grant, who is from Giant Grant Games, which is a large YouTube channel covering RTS. He is also a design consultant. In terms of game modes and the content, the game is very ambitious in its scale. I think this is because it started off on Kickstarter with quite a modest funding target, and it's blown through that and it's hit like seven further milestones in terms of stretch goals. So we're getting to see the sort of full creation. So one of the, the core game modes will be single player campaign, and there will be four main factions with 10 units and nine buildings each at a minimum. Beyond that, there'll also be six mercenary factions, each with four to five units unique to those sub-factions. 
and then there'll be 14 different heroes covering various factions that are available in the campaign modes and also you can select one to lead your multiplayer games as well. Now one of the first ambitious things that the developers are doing with the campaign is they're planning to combine RTS gameplay with RPG elements inspired by titles such as Baldur's Gate and Mass Effect. So this may look like decisions during the, the campaign which will have a fundamental impact on the way the story progresses and the content that you subsequently experience. So there'll be different branches which can lead to multiple endings, different campaign missions, etc. So to put some numbers behind that, there will be 13 main story missions within the campaign. Subsequently, there'll also be 14 what they call hero loyalty missions, which we'll find out more about near the time. And there'll be 40 side story arcs. So that really puts in perspective that based on the choices you make in the RPG elements, you could be taking very different paths through the campaign. There will also be ranked versus modes, so 1 versus 1 and 3v3 against other players, but also against AI to practice. There will also be co-op multiplayer, and this sounds quite ambitious. There'll be a shared persistent galaxy, so sort of a massively multiplayer experience where you team up against AI and complete objectives, very much inspired by StarCraft 2 co-op, which is a real success in the StarCraft 2 game, I think. So this is really interesting. Thousands of players all contributing to the sort of progress in the persistent galaxy. Now, obviously, it's great to have all these features, but the underlying gameplay has to be compelling, has to be fun. And from what we've heard from the various pros that have played this game and the sort of community figures, they think it is really, really polished already in terms of gameplay. They think it feels really good. It runs really well. And I just think it looks really nice. I think I love sort of projectile weapons and the sort of the sort of vast diversity of units and structures and things. It just looks really compelling. And I think the general consensus is this is looking really promising. And if they can get anywhere near the level of polish of a game like StarCraft 2, then this is going to be an absolute hit. So Frost Giant Studios is made up of many former Blizzard employees, people that worked on titles such as StarCraft 2, Warcraft 3. And they formed this studio to focus exclusively on creating RTS titles, the first of which, their big project, is called Stormgate. Now, I think we're much earlier in the development cycle of this game relative to Zero Space, and perhaps that kind of shows in the level of polish and the sort of the graphics, the, the unit animations and things like that. But that's not really important because, as I've said, other games that have been in alpha stages have had placeholder graphics, placeholder animations, it's not necessarily about the polish at this stage. It's just about the underlying game mechanics. You know, is it fun? Does it run well? So the developers have gone on record to say that they're trying to create the most inclusive RTS game they possibly can. So don't necessarily expect a laser focus on competitive 1v1. And certainly, one of their developers is Monk, who was a lead co-op designer of StarCraft 2. And I think the co-op in StarCraft 2 is probably the best thing about it nowadays. So very excited about the prospect of that in Stormgate and as far as everything else is concerned you can expect 1v1, 3v3 and a campaign so they're really trying to sort of like they say make it inclusive try to appeal to different types of players. The game is currently in a closed alpha and people participating are under an NDA so we don't know too much about how it is but um, I think it's early days and there's every reason to be optimistic and excited about this because I did a bit of a deep dive on the, the personnel behind it, and they've got a lot of talent on the team who have been involved in shipping some legendary RTS titles, going back to StarCraft Boudoir, obviously Warcraft 3, StarCraft 2. There's really a lot of talent at Frost Giant Studios, and I'm excited for this. I'd also like to shine a light on a few very small indie titles, the first of which is Arcane Wilds, which has been developed by a small Swiss studio consisting of three people. Now, what I really like about this game is that they've, they've tried to put a unique twist on the, the tried and tested RTS gameplay mechanics, and they've taken a bit of a risk. They've done things a bit differently. Now, the first thing that will be a bit different to players is the, the idea of logistics management. So you, to build things, you have to collect resources, which is very familiar. But those resources don't just magically appear in the UI as a number, and that's all that they're represented by. When you collect resources, you have to physically transport those resources to where you wish to build them into something. So if you collect some wood, 
you want to build a building, you know, on the other side of the map, that wood has to be transported across the map, put in position, and then gradually used as the building is constructed. And in the meantime, you could be robbed on the way, or you could be raided whilst the building is in production and lose that wood. The resources can be stolen, they can be intercepted. They're not yours just because you collected them. Another classic RTS mechanic which Arcane Wiles has turned on its head is the idea of having a supply or population cap. Now typically the traditional way you'd increase that would be to make buildings. So in StarCraft it's the famous supply depot or pylon. Well in Arcane Wilds the way that you increase your population is by acquiring fame. And that can be done in three ways. You can damage enemy units, you can build a building for the first time, so that's almost like a wonder in civilization. Or you can sell essence at the harbor. The essence is a resource you would collect by killing minions. Now the first one's interesting because damaging enemy units, that encourages activity. Think, think of Warcraft 3, you're out on the map, you're skirmishing, you're killing minion camps. You know, it's just, it's just good. It just promotes more active gameplay. So I think that's, that's interesting the way they've done that. Now obviously, with a small project in the early stages, the graphics are quite jarring. They're quite basic, the animations and everything else. But that's not necessarily a cause for concern because the underlying gameplay mechanics and the general concept I think are fantastic. I think they've got some really good ideas here and the polish to those visual aspects, that can come later. So yeah, I'm excited to see how this one develops and it's currently in closed beta so you can try your luck. Now I'm going to finish with a genuine one person project here. And this is a 2D space-based RTS called Age of Cores which you can currently play on the website through a browser, very similar to how you play Quake Live in a browser. After what I thought was a very tight and well-produced tutorial, you then progress into the main game where you navigate various galaxies and different missions and you face procedurally generated encounters. So there's a real replayability value because the sort of opponents and the various power-ups and things that you encounter on a given mission are randomized. The core gameplay, excuse the pun, is to basically you go on missions with your carrier, which is separate from your main mothership, and your carrier is basically trying to collect resources and to defeat the, the enemies and eventually the boss on a given mission. So you can build cannons on your ship, so laser beams, rocket launchers, projectiles, etc. You can also have a fleet of interceptor, so small fighters, and you can have frigates. So these can either be fighting ones, so destroyers, laser frigates, or they can be mining frigates, which help you to farm resources from the various asteroids and space debris and everything else on the map. Now there's immediately massive customization there, because I've done missions where I've entirely relied on having upgraded and powerful cannons on my ship to the expense of having no frigates, apart from a few couple of mining frigates. I've also done missions where I've barely touched my carrier in terms of upgrades, but it's been surrounded by a fleet of extremely powerful frigates. So there's really a lot of different ways that you can play the game. I've had my main ship have a massive amount of hit points, so it's hull. I've also had ones where I've had massive amounts of shielding, and instead of weapon turrets, I've had shield batteries, which help you to recharge your shield more quickly. So essentially I made a ship that was within reason, able to recharge its shields faster than the enemies could damage it. At the start of each mission, you basically have a very limited amount of resources and you start with a level one ship and your technology is equivalent. There are six different tiers of upgrading on the ship that you can do in each mission. And within that, there are six different tiers of research for you to customize your ship in the ways that you want to. So a real strong point of this game is massive customization, which I really enjoy. And it's quite well balanced, considering there's so many different things and different ways of playing, you know, economy focus, defense, offense, miscellaneous, which is kind of like speed bonuses and things and informational advantages. It's all nicely balanced, I think. Nothing's particularly broken that I noticed. No, there's kind of, there's like a persistence to this game because with each mission that you complete, you bring back resources and various credits and things to your mothership and you accumulate upgrades and research and various fighter planes and things to accompany your mothership. 
and then you keep sending your carrier on these individual missions to bring back more and more resources. So as you do that, your player levels up, your mothership gets stronger, you gain access to new technologies, new units, new upgrades, and you get like first win of the day bonuses. You can, if you do one mission, you can then simulate the next mission. So it, it sort of calculates if you win or lose and brings back resources. So there's this real sort of like feedback loop which encourages you to play the game on a daily basis or weekly basis. And it's similar to the StarCraft II co-op campaign with the sort of progression and everything. And I found it to be quite compelling. I mean, I spent far more time on this game than I kind of anticipated in making this video, for example. Now, I played this game for many hours in preparation for this video. And I honestly don't think I even scratched the surface. Considering this is a solo project, there's an awful lot of content in this game. I only just locked PvP towards the end, and there's various ship upgrades that I've not had access to yet. The game also has a small but very active community, which are providing lots of feedback and suggestions for new features and just seem very supportive and vocal. So I think the game is off to a positive start, and I'm very keen to see how it progresses. Many of the games that I covered today are either free to play and open access available right now, they are available in demo format, or they are in some kind of closed alpha or beta. So in most cases, you can probably get your hands on the game today if you're interested. And yeah, considering a lot of doom and gloom around the RTS genre on the PC, pleasantly surprised by what's on the horizon, and especially Homeworld 3. I mean, that was huge. To see that they're developing that after 20 years, it's just it's really exciting. So. Yeah, I think maybe good things to come in the next couple of years for the genre. Why don't you stick a comment down below and tell me which one you're most interested in? Or I'm sure there's some that you're excited about that I've actually missed, so let me know about those as well. And thank you for watching.